we were not just in this plain old theater. It, was, it never felt like it was a plain old play. We were really introducing a whole new world to these people, people who had never met a Jew in their lives. It's an emotional train. You ride that train every night and twice on matinee day. It kind of changed the way that I thought about history and also the world. I had sincerity. I wanted to play this girl that I empathized with and had been murdered by the Nazis. I wanted to play her right. You know, it's just something that I feel like I will probably carry with me for my whole life. We, in short, we don't need to do any warm-up. We don't need to do any ritual. We can just go to the scene. Yeah, we are not. We don't need to warm up. Okay, okay. okay. Listen, listen for the chimes. Well, what page are we on? I'm on page 81. Uh, well, I'm on... This is the one that begins. Yeah. This is, she's just entered his room. This is Adam Langer, the creator and host of Playing Anne Frank, a podcast from the forward about the dramatic life of the diary of Anne Frank. I'm sitting at a desk in my apartment in New York. I've just opened my Zoom room. Steve Press is talking to me from his house in Dutchess County, New York. Pauline Hahn is at home in New Jersey. When I first spoke to Pauline, she told me that playing Anne Frank was the height of her acting career. She and Steve were in the touring company of the play, and the two of them are about to perform a scene that they haven't done together in about 65 years. While I've been working on this podcast, I've been struck by how many times this play was performed back in the 1950s, and yet there seems to be no video or audio recording of any of those shows. Nothing I've been able to find anyway. So I asked Pauline and Steve to read a little bit, so we could have at least some record of this show that meant so much to so many people who were in it. I asked if they wanted to do some warm-ups first, maybe rehearse a little bit, but they're from a different generation of actors, not a lot of fuss. You just do it. And they've performed these scenes together more than a hundred times. Pauline Hahn and Steve Press are in their 80s now, but when they read, you can imagine what it was like when they were playing a couple of teenagers named Anne and Peter. I know quite well that I'm not a beauty. I never have been and never shall be. Well, I don't agree at all. I think you're pretty. That's not true. A and another thing, you've changed uh, from at first, I mean. Uh -huh. I used to think you were awful noisy. And what do you think now, Peter? How have I changed? This is episode four, Anne on the Road. When people talk about the play The Diary of Anne Frank in the 1950s, mostly they're talking about Broadway. But that wasn't the only place it played. While the show was selling out the court and the Ambassador Theatres, there were productions in England, South Africa, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Holland, Finland, Italy, Greece, Japan, Israel. In Argentina, Anne Frank played in five theatres simultaneously in five different languages, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italian, and Yiddish. And the show played 90 cities in Germany alone. Back then, the press agent for Anne Frank said the play had been seen by more than one million Germans, and the waiting list there for student-rate tickets was more than 33,000. Peter Dan Levin, he's the actor who originated the part of Peter Van Dan on Broadway, he told me about what it was like to see the show in Germany. I saw it in Stuttgart. I, I knew enough Yiddish, uh, but, but I, I didn't, I didn't uh, need to speak German. I did after a while because I studied it while I was there. And I saw this young lady uh, doing Anne Frank. <sighs> Sorry. <sighs> and I watched, I watched the whole play. <sighs> Sorry. It's okay. At the end, nobody applauded. It was silent. 
And I went backstage. I introduced myself. I said, I'm a Schauspieler. That means an actor in Germany. And her name was Gustl Halenka. And uh, she was fabulous. The, the whole stage play was wonderful. Wonderful. I thought better than ours. And we became friends. And we're still friends. And uh, I think she's going to die soon. But she lives in Munich now. And she was a wonderful actress. The Broadway cast, some of them anyway, went out on a national tour. They played Chicago, L.A., Boston, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. Joan DeMarais played Meep Geese. I spoke to her daughter, Laura Marvin Smith, about the show. It was just such an experience for her. I think it was, you know, her first traveling show that she was in, and it had a profound experience on her life. She always spoke about that particular show. The national tour got great reviews everywhere except Chicago. There was a critic there named Claudia Cassidy. If you're from Chicago like me and you're of a certain age, you know that name. She was one of those critics who could make or break a show. For real. And that night she broke it. She'd liked the Broadway production, but the touring production? She didn't think it measured up. The spell that once held audiences taut has snapped, she wrote. There were some things going on with the show that she didn't talk about, maybe didn't even know about. Steve Press, who was playing Peter, he told the story to me and Pauline Hahn. The production in Chicago that opening night was a mess. Um, Why? Because of all the stress. Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, the young girl playing Anne Frank in one of the big scenes, she throws herself down on the bed and she hit her head on the end of the bed uh, and knocked herself out. Abby and, Kellogg? Was that Abby Kellogg? Yes, Abigail Kellogg. She knocked her, as a matter of fact, one of the headlines in Chicago newspapers the next day was, actress knocks herself out. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to stop the production and revive her. She wanted to go on with it. And she did and did a, an excellent job, but uh, it just threw everybody off. The rhythm was lost. It, it was. The rhythm was and, lost. And the audience doesn't know what's missing. They only know that something is missing, and they yes. can decide what it was. The national tour closed in Washington, D.C. in May 1958, but the producers of the show felt there was more life left in it. They wanted to take the play to smaller communities in America, ones that weren't so familiar with the story and the history. So they launched something they called the Bus and Truck Tour. It was part of a package of touring shows. You could go to your local theater and get a subscription series. You could see Auntie Mame and Little Abner and The Diary of Anne Frank. In the fall of 1958, a touring company of The Diary of Anne Frank hit the road. Norfolk, Virginia, Duke University, Richmond, the Benet Brith in Lynchburg, Ohio, Kansas, Nebraska, Michigan, Vermont, South Carolina, two cities in Alabama, four in Arkansas. They never stayed more than three nights in any location. At every stop, they sold copies of Anne Frank's diary and documented the sales and handwritten notes that you can see for yourself when you look at the producer's archives. They sold 152 copies in Toledo, 301 in South Bend, 149 in Des Moines. The show opened on September 27th, 1958. Do you remember where the first show you did was? Where, where you started? Of Anne Frank? Yes. Norfolk, Virginia. And you won't believe this. You can't make this up. On the way to rehearsal, we passed a building and a piece of steel sliver went into my cornea. Within minutes, I was at their prime eye surgeon. He took it out with a magnet. And I had anesthetic, and uh, I was not there for the rehearsal, but I was there for the show. There aren't any official stats on this, but it seems pretty safe to say that Steve Press 
has played Peter Van Dan more than any other actor in the history of the show. He played Peter on Broadway, on the National Tour, and on the Bus and Truck Tour. 800 performances, he says. It was a bus and truck tour. So we were going with a bus, and we started out with a big sign across the body of the bus that said the Diary of Anne Frank. Eventually we took that down because of some fear of what was going on. And wherever we went, we would be followed by a police cruiser who was making sure that everything was all right. And there was always a police presence in the audience to make sure that nothing bad ever happened. And nothing bad ever happened loved every moment of it, uh, because the audience response was so extraordinary. The audience was so varied and so wonderful. There was the, the adult audience who were very taken and moved by the Holocaust and all that it meant. And then there were the young people. And more and more and more, it was the young people because they found the relationship. The, the play was not about Anne and her family. The play for them was about Peter and Anna. And they would applaud and cheer. And when Peter and Anna finally kissed in that, in that little scene, they, the, the kids would cheer. The adults would come to see it. And then they would go home and say, we've got to go back. We have to take the children or the grandchildren. Uh, so the play became literally a love story. Bloomington, Indiana. I would be sitting in the front, actually to the audience, but supposedly turning away from Peter. And she says, I say, Peter, have you ever kissed a girl? And there were titters throughout the audience. They were embarrassed. They were children. And I was talking about kissing. I yeah. love yeah. that place. I love that place. Well, because you know, I knew that I had reached them, that they felt exactly as I felt. I'll bet when you get out of here, you'll never think of me again. That's crazy. When you get back with all your friends, you're going to say, now, what did I ever see in that Mrs. Quack Quack? I, I, I haven't got any friends. Okay, of course you have. Everyone has friends. Not me. I don't want any. I get along all right without them. Does that mean you can get along without me? I think of myself as your friend. No. If, if they were all like you, it, it, it'd be different. Peter, have you ever kissed a girl? Yes. Once. Huh? Was she pretty? I'm Harry Anantasa. And I'm Daniel Zana. And together we host a podcast called Jews on Film that analyzes a new film each episode, ranging from the explicitly Jewish, think of Yentl, Frisco Kid, and Inglorious Bastards, to the movies that don't seem so Jewish at first glance, like Booksmart, Clueless, and A Clockwork Orange. We end each episode by ranking the film's Jewishness in terms of its cast and crew, content, and themes. So tune in today wherever you get your podcasts. Everybody got along. There was nothing. There was never any trouble or dissension. It was a family. I don't know how you can travel and work together for a year almost and not be like a family. We cared about each other, and we had wonderful times together. That's Renee Pesson. She took over the role of Meep Geese on Broadway, and she played Margaret in The National Company. We celebrated birthdays. 
and holidays. I remember us cooking and baking for Thanksgiving and having the cast over. It was fun. When you listen to members of the cast tell stories about touring America with Anne Frank, it sounds so peaceful, optimistic, almost innocent. You have to step back a little to realize what a profound experience this must have been, both for the cast and the audience. In 1958, America was only just starting to get a taste of the Jewish story. The big Jewish movie that year was Marjorie Morningstar, with Gene Kelly and Natalie Wood, who played a young woman who doesn't want just an ordinary Jewish life. Marjorie, we're an error in matchmaking. You're on a course charted by 5,000 years of Moses and his Ten Commandments. Why are you telling me all this? What are you trying to prove? If you don't want anything to do with me, then forget about me. Get somebody else. I don't want anybody else. When the bus and truck tour started, Dwight Eisenhower was president. This was nuclear anxiety time. The U.S. and the USSR threatening to blow each other off the map. Let us face, without panic, the reality of our time. The fact that atom bombs may someday be dropped on our cities. And let us prepare for survival by understanding the weapon that threatens us. In 1958, the Civil Rights Act was half a decade away. Segregated water fountains? They were still a thing in some states. The same month that the Anne Frank bus and truck tour started, Little Rock, Arkansas voted to close down public schools so they didn't have to comply with orders to desegregate. The Diary of Anne Frank played Little Rock. They played Birmingham, Alabama, too. That's where more than a dozen blacks were arrested for boarding the front of a bus in 1958. They played Greensboro, North Carolina, two years before the lunch counter boycott at Woolworths. Shreveport, three months after Martin Luther King spoke there at the Galilee Baptist Church. In the South, as elsewhere, citizens are keenly aware of the tremendous disservice that has been done to the people of Arkansas in the eyes of the nation, and that has been done to the nation in the eyes of the world. That was President Dwight Eisenhower. Steve Press told me that in some towns in the South, the cast and the crew of the Diary of Anne Frank had to stay in different hotels. Anyone who was Black, whoever was part of the production, had to stay in the Black part of town. It was a learning lesson for all of us. So into this world of nuclear paranoia, of racist violence, segregated buses and schools, at a time when there were still quotas for Jews at colleges and universities, when country clubs were still restricted, came this play about a girl and her family and their friends hiding from the Holocaust. A lot of people who saw the Diary of Anne Frank on the bus and truck tour, this was the first they learned of the atrocities of World War II. And, as Steve Press told me, for some people who met the actors playing Anne Frank and Peter Van Dan on tour, these were the first Jews they'd ever seen. Some of the communities we went to, there were no Jewish populations whatsoever. So we were really introducing a whole new world uh, to these people, people who had never met a Jew in their lives, didn't know anything uh, about Judaism, didn't know anything about the Holocaust. And th the beauty of the production is that it opened up this book into a new world because Teachers would stop and ask us questions. Could we do a production of this in our high school? Could I possibly assign this book uh, in an English class? And we, of course, said, yes, how important that is. And it began to happen. It wasn't all like that, though. Audiences in small town America, they weren't always all that welcoming. Steve and Pauline told me they both remember times when they felt out of place as Jewish actors playing Jewish characters in very non-Jewish locations. Well, there is a line in the play where, where Otto Frank says, did we start the war? Is this a... And every yes, once yes. Once in a while, from the audience would come a voice saying, yes, you did. When they got to New Orleans, they got a bad review. And not for the same reasons they got a bad one in Chicago. In New Orleans, I was invited to have luncheon, a very fancy place. 
uh, with what I call the Grand Dames of New Orleans. And we sit at a table and somebody says to me, we understand that you are Jewish. Isn't that wonderful? And at that moment, I knew that a Jew had never walked into that place before. And in New Orleans, we got the only pan. I don't have the newspaper, but I should. It said the sets were terrible, the lights were terrible, the acting was terrible. And besides, it's a lie. It didn't happen. It never happened. That was what our review was in New Orleans. 101 performances as Anne Frank. How did that impact you emotionally in the times when you weren't on stage? I mean, you do this story again and again. You know how it ends. You know the experience. How does that affect you as well, a person, not just when you're on stage? I didn't believe my parents when they told me about persecution of Jews. I thought they were lying and was very ashamed of that. But when I got Dari Van Frank was the first time I read about it. And I read these books for the first time. And I never knew that it was true. I never knew it. I never believed it. I was one of those who said, oh, they're always complaining those Jews, I didn't believe them. And the reason I didn't believe them is they didn't tell me the details. They just said the outside. I was ashamed of my parents for lying and making up this story. So did it change me? It changed me, of course. I never went to Amsterdam to see the place. It was easy for me to go. I'd been in Europe so many times. I couldn't bear to see it. The stage was my hidden ad. In the Zoom room, I'm talking with Steve Press and Pauline Hahn about their lives before and after Anne Frank. Both of them were profoundly affected by their experience in the show, but... That meant very different things to each of them. For Steve, Anne Frank was the show he always came back to. 800 performances as Peter Van Dan. He taught the show and directed it when he was a professor at Dutchess Community College. In 2004, he directed it off-Broadway. Everybody realized how important this play and this book was to keep alive the memory and the story of the Holocaust, and that continues today. When Pauline joined the company of Anne Frank, she was already a veteran actor. She'd done a ventriloquist act on the Borscht Belt circuit. When she was seven, she made her Broadway debut in a musical called As the Girls Go. At 14 in 1955, she was in the original Broadway cast of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. But soon after she starred in Anne Frank, she turned away from the spotlight. Anne Frank had been such a joyful experience that it made what came afterwards all the more devastating. Pauline's last role was in a 1960 movie called Too Young to Love. It was about a middle-aged man on trial for having sex with a girl who he didn't realize was only 15. For Pauline, memories of that experience are not happy ones. She wrote in a journal about it, and she read some of that journal to me. I was crushed to discover that an ingenue starlet was not an actress, for acting had little to do with her job description. And that the absent job description had fine print. Never been kissed, never looked into a boy's eyes, never held a boy's hand, never had a date, never been alone with a boy for a single minute. A boy from the touring company had asked me to his he was the uh, assistant stage manager, asked me to his hotel room during diary. I was 15, and I'd had no idea what it was for. I thought it was to listen to phonograph records and was looking around trying to measure with my eyes just how the four of us teens would have to position ourselves in order to manage 
to dance in that tight space. I didn't for years understand. When he answered my expression with, do you hate me for wanting to make love to you? I had no idea. It was a curious thing to say, make love to you, but it was pretty and poetic and didn't occur to me to wonder what it meant. I still hadn't guessed when I arrived in London that night. When I left London three months later, throwing my next movie contract to get to Hollywood and my career away at a run, I did. Pauline went into academia. She did her dissertation on Hallie Flanagan and the Federal Theater Project. She taught at Vassar, Columbia, the University of Maryland, and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. But her career as an actor, chasing renown, that was more or less through after Anne Frank. How often does your mind return to Anne? How often do you think about her? Probably a lot. <laughs> as little as I can. Why do you say it's that? painful to remember the good times. But I do think about the acting and what I learned. I've asked Pauline and Steve to read one more scene together. This is Anne and Peter's final scene, a moment of hope before that hope is completely destroyed. It's strange seeing the two of them together, Pauline and Steve, playing characters 70 years younger than they are today. For a moment, you start to imagine them as the adults that Anne Frank and Peter Van Dan never were allowed to become. And you start wondering what would have happened to Peter and Anne if they had survived, if conversation would be as easy as it seems to be for Pauline and Steve. But the way the scene ends leaves no doubt. That never could have happened. Look at us, hiding out for two years, not able to move, caught just like waiting for them to come and get us. And all for what? We're not the only people that have had to suffer. There have always been people that have had to, sometimes one race, sometimes another, and yet... That doesn't make me feel any better. I know it's terrible trying to have any faith when people are doing such horrible things. But you know what I sometimes think? I think the world may be going through a phase the way I was with mother it'll pass maybe not for hundreds of years but someday I still believe in spite of everything that people are really good at heart I want to see something now not a thousand years from now but Peter if only you'd look at it as part of a great pattern that we're just a little minute in the life. <sighs> Listen to us going on at each other like a couple of stupid grown-ups. Look at the sky now. Isn't it lovely? Someday, when we're outside again, I'm going to... She breaks off. She hears the sound of a car outside. It's brakes squeaking as it comes to a sudden stop. The people in the other room also become aware of the sound. They listen tensely. Another car outside roars up to a sudden stop. Mr. and Mrs. Fondan come creeping down the stairs. Dussel comes out from his room. Everyone is listening. Suddenly, a doorbell rings again and again in the building below. Mr. Frank starts quietly down the steps to the door. Diesel and Peter follow him. The others stand rigid, waiting, terrified. In a few seconds, Diesel comes stumbling back up the steps. He shakes off Peter's help and goes to his room. Mr. Frank bolts the door below and comes slowly back up the steps. 
Your eyes are all on him as he stands there for a minute. They realize that what they feared has happened. The last show of the bus and truck tour was on December 20th, 1958, at Ovens Auditorium in Charlotte, North Carolina. By that time, it seemed as if Anne Frank had been in just about every city of America, but it was about to go to a whole lot more. Coming up on our next episode, Anne Goes to Hollywood. You've been listening to Playing Anne Frank. I'm Adam Langer. I'm the executive editor of The Forward. I wrote and created this podcast. It was produced and engineered by Cole Ocasio. Our associate producer is Scylla Shaman. She composed the original score, which features Anat Cohen on clarinet. Playing Anne Frank is a production of The Forward. Our editor-in-chief is Jody Redoran, and our CEO is Rachel fishman Federson. Playing Anne Frank is made possible in part by funding from Canvas, the Cy Sims Foundation, and Barbara Streisand. Our consulting producers are Julianne Hausler, Doug Matica, and Jerome Kramer, Additional editing and research by Samuel Breslow, Irene Katz Connolly, Mira Fox, PJ Grissar, Beth Harpaz, and Matt Littman. The Forward's VP of Development is Lisa Lepson. Our grants manager is Jason Mandel. Our digital innovation director is Jacqueline DeBonis. Designed by Anya Ulinich and Angeli Zaslavsky. Special thanks to Stephanie Abu, Marie Kuhlman, Elizabeth Ellis, Jay Ehrlich, Whit Lacasio, Daniel Liddell, Charlie Meyerson, Lauren Allerhead, Dahlia Shaman, Solvay Zisnich, and to Lauren Pissell of Tink Media and Talia Zaks. The Forward Association is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded in 1897.